All right. We're all live. I think we figured it out. Tech supporting. <laughs> all righty, everybody. So I am Drew from MakerMade, and I am joined today by Nick Barros, our new mod on our owners group. Hey, Nick. Hey, how you doing today? Doing? I'm doing good. Awesome, man. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. Pretty excited about it. So we're going to be doing this. We're, I'm going to be trying to keep up on our phones with questions in the group. So if you want to look and post a question on here, then you can. And the way that we're sharing this is what might be like a little bit of delay because we'll have to check and see the questions um, as we chat. So we're just going to start kind of chatting a little bit and talking about some stuff. And then we can, uh, we can go ahead and, and take some questions and things and just learn about some of the awesome projects that Nick's been working on. So Nick, uh, Thanks a lot for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you got into making? Uh, yeah, um, I guess uh, I've always just kind of been, been a tinkerer. And so um, it just kind of came naturally. And um, uh, I, I knew that I was super in interested in working with wood and um, well, mostly wood, but uh, it's, you know, since expanded, but uh, I think um, I just found it really interesting that you could tell a computer to cut something and it would cut something for you. So basically the sky's the limit when it comes to that kind of stuff. So awesome. Uh, so yeah, I just uh, woke up one day and just decided I wanted to get into that kind of stuff. And um, you know, since I was little, I've always kind of tinkered with electronics and things like that. So it kind of just was a bridge for everything else that, uh, that I could play with. So that's kind of what I use the machine for now is a little bit of electronics, a little bit of woodworking. Awesome. It just depends on what I'm working on at, at the moment. So did you start with like power tools and hand tools and then you kind of discovered CNC from, from that or how did you, how did you find CNC? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people who are uh, at least in my age group, a lot of people kind of say that when they're kids, they like to take things apart and see how they work. And so everything sort of started with that. Uh, Kind of figuring out how things worked and um, just via tearing everything down. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't really get into the really get into the CNC stuff until later in life. But uh, um, I think I've been doing it for about three or four years now. Um, is about uh, is about where I'm at. But uh, um, I kind of just I think it, it was just a, a natural thing to to jump to this. Um, I don't know if there was anything in particular that kind of swayed me towards CNCs. I just like the idea of being able to, you know, think of something in my head, put it into Illustrator or Photoshop or something and create the path. And then the computer just follows that path. So that to me was really cool. So. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's one of the cool things about these like little automated robots. You could just be like, Hey robot, I have an idea. And then they can just like go off and make it. So well, like what's been what's some of your favorite projects then that you've, that you've created? Um, well, primarily I work with, I work on arcades. So I build like, uh, I guess what you would call multi-cades, um, and virtual pinball machines. Awesome. So essentially they look the same as a pinball, uh, that you would find in like an arcade, except for, uh, instead of having like a regular back glass with a lot of hardware and little metal pieces and stuff, you're basically using a TV. So, um, a little bit of, uh, computer stuff where you have a program that, um, you know, creates the atmosphere and there's a lot of really talented designers out there who've done like really, you know, high end photography and high end, uh, you know, photographs of the actual back glasses from the real uh, pinball machines. And then they've turned them into basically 3D renders of those. So um, I basically build a machine that plays anything from like, you know, really, really basic arcade games from, you know, when our parents were children, all the way up to current stuff. So. Um, you know, it's basically I, I use the machine to, to build the cabinet. Um, and then I do all the electronics, all the soldering, all the wiring, everything else kind of comes together and in, into a, you know, a cool machine. That's awesome. So do you make custom machines based on like, you know, you have like a fighting game one that's like all the different battle games, you know, like Mortal Kombat and whatnot, and then have, you know, like uh, Space Invaders type theme with sci-fi games. Is that kind of how you frame when, when you make, when you make them or is it? It's usually I kind of theme it. I kind of theme it based on you know what the what the person who's asking for is interested in. So um, you know I can put an emphasis on something, and if they wanted just a machine that just has a bunch of fighting games on it, I can do that too. Um, but my most recent machine is a Tron machine. So I used Maslow. Oh, uh, I did like a 
a really cool design with the Maslow where um, it's basically like a circuit board. So I cut some circuits out of the sides of the cabinet and then I backfilled it with epoxy and then backlit that with uh, LEDs. So it kind of looks like this like sort of Tron-y. The glowing uh, like Tron thing. rings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. um, that machine has, I think, close to about 120,000 games on it. So it just depends on what people are interested in. I can, like I said, I can do a specific one that's just fighting games or just gun shooting games or, you know, basic arcade stuff like Missile Command or anything like that. But I, I make mine so that you can kind of play anything. So it's really just whatever you're interested in. But as far as the art and stuff goes, it's really just themed towards like what people like. Like I've done one that's just like a Rocky Balboa one, even though there was like really a limited amount of games that had anything to do with Rocky. So it'll be like, you know, a picture of Sylvester Stallone on the side and, you know, some cool Rocky stuff on, on the marquee that's backlit and stuff like that. But nice. I really try to kind of throw a little bit of everything in there because you never know who's going to play it. Absolutely. And, and th I mean, those specialized games are really cool, too, because we have both a uh, and Sarah just joined us, too. Are you there, Sarah? Hey, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> I think she joined us. She might have jumped back out. Um, well, if uh, yeah, we so we've got like a local arcade that's like gets a kids arcade. It's like classic like seventies and eighties arcade that I've been to before. That's awesome. And then we have like a local bar too that has like pinball machines and some arcade games and things like that. So I know that it's been really picking up like retro and being able to have like an emulator basically that can play all that stuff is it's come a long way for sure. So have yeah. you made those with um, the Maslow and the M two? Because you just recently got an M two as well. Is it we've mostly just been the Maslow? Yeah, so so it, it has up until a point been just the Maslow, but, um, you know, as you said, I just got the new M2, and uh, really what I'm working on right now is trying to get my frame situated, so I had been using a wood frame, um, and right now I'm switching to a super stripe frame, so all metal. Nice. Um, unfortunately, because of my schedule, it's been tough to kind of make the cuts and get it all pieced together, but I'm kind of slowly putting it all together and trying to get my angles correct, and I really want it to be like the whole point is for it to be super, super accurate. Um, because now that I've got the, the, the faster uh, M2 with the faster Z axis, it's going to make it a lot easier to do all the little yeah. holes and drill, drill operations and stuff that I do. So as soon as I get that frame nailed down, then it's probably going to be almost full time M2. Right on. Hey, Sarah, I think you're in now. Maybe. <laughs> well is, is that why you wanted to go to all metal then like why why did you decide that you want to make an all metal frame instead of a instead of a wooden one it's just for that for the accuracy or vibrations or can you kind of maybe explain to people that might not um know why you want to make that switch yeah so uh one of the things i noticed with the original maslow is those the motors that are on it as well as uh, your machine uh the motors that are on it are really powerful so um it, with wood there's just a lot of flex in it and um, I felt like with that flex that it was causing some accuracy problems with the cuts. Um, but the biggest thing is that with the old design from Maslow, there's not really any center support. So what was happening was my, um, my waste board was bowing. And so okay. that was causing some inaccuracies in the center of the board where it was bowing the most. So the idea really is to, to get those center supports in there. And you could theoretically just add those center ports to the original frame and it would be no problem. Um, but I figured if I was going to make it, the center supports out of metal, that I might as well just make the whole thing out of metal. And no, I like the fact- worry about it. Yeah. Right. And I, and I like the fact with the super struts that, um, you know, if, if, if you guys come out with a different design later on or something like that, I could just take the whole thing apart and start over again. And I'm not, you know, just tossing a bunch of wood into the garbage. So less waste. Right on. Uh, yeah, it's like a big erector set, basically, that you can kind of modify yeah. and change. And yeah, awesome. Yeah, and this, the super struts have, you know, they've probably got like a thousand different kinds of connectors and different bolts and different ways of connecting it. And they even have like little hinge systems that you can buy. So um, it, it's really kind of like the sky's the limit when it comes to that. So Fantastic. Yeah, so um, have you been mostly making it and, and I'm not really sure if you're using, is it mostly the hike hobbies that you make the, uh, those arcades for? Is that kind of like a side business or do you use it for the, the Maslow and the M2 more for like hobby projects or more for like business projects and like entrepreneurial ideas? Um, honestly, it's a little bit of both. Um, I have my secondary business is a sign, a sign business. So I do a lot okay. of, uh, I also have a laser cutter. So I do a lot of laser cutting stuff. Um, 
Um, and so really I use it a lot for that, for doing large scale signs. So anything above like four feet, um, I'll use it for that. Um, and then if, it, if I go really small, like, you know, a one foot by two foot sign, then I typically do that in laser just cause it, it can handle the smaller parts better. Uh -huh. um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. Like I've built tables with the Maslow and the maker made, um, I've, you know, I've built like end tables and all kinds of things. Um, I think what it just boils down to is just, I'm terrible at, you know, really weird and intricate, like circular cuts of sorts. So having the computer do stuff like that, straight <laughs> cuts are no problem. I can do that with a circular saw yeah. all day. But when you're getting into complicated stuff and, um, you know, uh, like carving and stuff like that, that, that kind of stuff is where, you know, the maker made CNC comes in handy. Um, Cause I just, it's just really difficult to do that stuff by hand. Yeah, so that's something that I, I'm not a, a very good uh, like artist when it comes to drawing either. Like, it's, I'll much rather have the, I can draw some lines in Fusion and have the robot do it, like, <laughs> for sure. So, yeah, I totally feel you with that. Um, so, Sarah said that she's in the chat, and I guess Brad just asked. Um, yeah, he just said doing long straight cuts and getting Bowen in the center and edges are fine. So, but just like, as you were talking about, um, just with that waste board and having that waste board down, that's a, that's kind of a perfect thing, I guess, with a, a segue into like, what kind of tips and tricks would you give users that might be having like beginner issues and things like that? Or maybe, maybe if you're just using the Maslow or the M2 for a while, like what kind of tips would you help? Um, would you, would you share? Um, I, I think that, you know, um, I've, I've spoken to Brad before, um, so I know a little bit about his situation, but uh, I think primarily what it boils down to is getting a really good calibration. And I know he's done that many a times, but you just never know uh, if something's throwing it off or, you know, for, for me, like um, when, I first, when I first put the Maslow together, I was trying to cut circles. And for, for the life of me, I could not figure out why I was getting ovals. So everything, everything would come out as a football and I couldn't figure out why that was happening. Um, and then someone mentioned the, um, you know, that when you, when you measure the, uh, the chain from one motor to the other motor, I was forgetting to take the slack out of it. So it was dragging all that chain back and it was giving me a really weird, you know, number like 4,000, uh -huh. 5,000 millimeters instead of, you know, 3,000. So um, as soon as I figured that out, you know, that, that, that fixed my issue and I was cutting perfect circles, but, um, with his problem, uh, you know, it, it's kind of difficult. It might be, um, a calibration issue. It could be a chain guide issue. It could be skipping. Um, uh, it could be bowing with the, with the waste board. Um, I guess the biggest thing would just make sure that everything you build your frame out of is real straight. It should be as straight as possible. <laughs> Yeah, um, especially if you're buying all your wood from a big box store, um, that can cause a lot of problems. Um, but in general, Brad's issue, uh, I'm not really sure what, what could cause. He's saying that he was, he was, he was telling me that he was cutting squares and cutting circles and all of the uh, measurements were bang on. But as soon as he would just try to do a straight line, um, to me, that sounds like, um, it could be that he's getting bit wandering. So the bit's grabbing or he's trying to cut too fast or too slow or the motor's not at the proper RPMs and it's kind of making squiggly, you know, warping. It's, like, it's kind of like getting caught in the material. Yeah, um, but hard to say. I'd have to actually see a video of it performing and see what he's doing and how the, you know, what kind of RPMs he's using on his router and stuff like that. So, hey, uh, Brad, if you could elaborate more on maybe your settings and what you're using, um, maybe we could. Yeah, we can get you going. Yeah, we can post it in the users group. You can always email us too. Uh, support at MakerMade too. We can try to try to help you tackle it as well. Because with so those big tips then were making sure that all your wood is straight in your frame, and then working on your calibration and getting your calibration like bang on. Those are the those are the two biggest tips that that you have for for beginners. Yeah, and um, it looks like Brad just said that his. Uh, it looks like he said maybe his top beam was warped. So. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, the top beam, as far as yeah, accuracy yeah. Of the machine, the top beam is key. So everything else can be a little weird and wonky. It might make your cuts a little shallow or a little bit deeper than they should be. But if your top beam is warped, it's pretty much game over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, it, it's gotta be straight because it's, as it's moving across and it's going, it's doing all the math. And if, if it's not, if it's not just right and it's bending in or bending out or something like that. Yeah. I could totally see how it just throw all the calibration off. 
for sure. Um, yeah, so, I see that he said. Uh, I see that he said that his uh, router was at thirty-two uh, thousand RPMs. So, um, Brad, are you using the uh, which which router are you using? Are you using the rigid or? Because um, I think, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe that thirty-two thousand is the maximum speed on the rigid. Could I'm not sure. About. I don't have a rigid router, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, and I found that, uh, and for the longest time, I was using my router at the fastest speed. And I just thought, to me, it just sounded like the more speed and the more power you're putting on the router, the better it's cutting. Mm -hmm. But reality, um, sometimes you're cutting it so, it's cutting, uh, it's hard to explain, but it's, it's, it's cutting like butter so much that there's no friction on either side of the cut. So it's just kind of going crazy. It's just like spinning so fast and like pulling the wood out or pushing the wood in that it's, yeah. it's like 3D printing kind of like if it goes too fast, you're kind of held by the physics itself yeah. and gravity. It can only go so fast. So like what, what, what have you seen as like a good baseline then? Is it, is it more material focused? Like if you're cutting in like oak or something like that, then you want to like have faster RPM or like what kind of tips would you have for somebody that's working with RPM? Um, well, so for me, the way I figured it out was, um, I think, I think the biggest downside from uh, the rigid, cause that's what I use. Um, I think the biggest downside from that is that when you're comparing that to like a standard CNC spindle, which has way, uh, vastly superior, uh, uh, you know, bearings and stuff in it. Um, what, what, what I found was that I listened for the motor to kind of trim out. So if you kind of similar to, if you ever worked on a truck before. Um, and you're working on the idle. If the idle sounds rough and it's kind of moving up and down and it's got these yeah. you know, ebbs and flows, then that's not where you want to be. You want it to be where it's kind of just smooth across the whole band line. And so I kind of found, um, and the problem with the rigid too is that it's, it's numbered. Um, so it's, there's kind of like a one to a hundred on the dial. There's not really a very specific oh, okay. uh, RPM range. Is percentage so, almost, I guess? Yeah, so for me it was, I found that is I would turn I would turn it all the way up and then turn it down until it sounded like the motor was kind of uh humming um evenly um and that that worked really well for me and I seem to get really accurate cuts with that and I don't get a lot of uh you know um bit wandering or anything like that from that so the biggest tip would be finding the proper rpm range um and that could vary from rigid to rigid because I'm not sure how they manufacture those but mm -hmm. uh I would just try to listen for the motor to smooth out. And as soon as that smooths out, give your cut a little try. If you're still getting a little wandering, maybe turn it up a little bit, uh, turn it down a little bit, just kind of play with it. I mean, you know, I've yeah. got three years on this machine, so, you know, I've had plenty of failed cuts. So <laughs> it's just a matter of playing with it to find that perfect setting. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, then that kind of fits to Jason's question right there about the averages. You just kind of, kind of figure out what's best for your router and the material that you're cutting and kind of just listen to it. Um, you know, like, like you mentioned, like an engine or like a manual transmission and just, you know, making sure that it's, it's, it's where you want it to be. So, um, right on. Yeah. And then Sarah, as, as you're checking out questions, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to Sarah and say, could you check YouTube too and see if there's any qu comments or questions on YouTube as well? Um, and pull that up. That'd be sweet. And I want to make sure that we're not missing anybody um, that's on YouTube. That'd be awesome. So um, like, what are some things that you're excited about making next? Nick, you got anything uh, in the works? Yeah. So I was telling you before um, that uh, I actually just got off the phone with a gentleman who's um, interested in having uh, me make some obstacles for a television show called uh, American Ninja Warrior. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, um, so far I've only had like a 45 minute conversation with him. Uh, I don't know much about the project itself, but uh, I do have a background in, uh, in uh, film and television. That's what I do as a full-time job. So um, so he called me up based on, uh, you know, uh, my, my business ad that I have on Google that's uh, for custom CNC work. So um, he reached out to me and said he's just looking for somebody to do some small scale stuff for the show. And uh, we're going to sit down this weekend and uh, talk about that and uh, see, if, uh, see if it'll work out. That's awesome. So have you made um, different types of, of obstacles or anything that, that's similar with that with, with your uh, movie and television background? Yeah, so I've, I've worked on um, not too many television shows that are related to obstacle courses, but I've worked on a lot of like uh, 
Tough Mudders and um, some obstacle course races. Um, awesome. But that's from my rigging background. So that's mostly truss work and stuff like that. So not a lot of woodwork, but um, this kind of stuff. Uh, and like I said, I don't really know much about what kind of obstacles they have in mind. Um, but they did mention wood and HDPE. So um, that's not something that I have a ton of um, experience with HDPE, um, except for that I put it on the bottom of my sled to make it slicker so that it travels across my wasteboard easier. So it can move around? Oh, right on. Yeah, so I mean, that sounds like an exciting challenge then to find out like how the different intricacies can work together and kind of combine all of your knowledge together to like make something new. So yeah, yeah sweet. Yeah, so, so it looks, looks like uh, George has uh, a question, um, wants to know what's the most complex build that you've done um, on like a vertical CNC like the Maslow? Uh, I guess recently, um, I don't know, complicated is kind of a tough, tough question because that's kind of based on my skills as far as design <laughs> is concerned. Which yeah. is, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm technically minded. I'm not very design minded. So uh, a lot of times I will do designs based on what people approach me for. So they'll ask me to do something and I can kind of piece that together as long as they're giving me an idea. Yeah. Uh, but I would say the most complicated so far has been the arcade. Um, uh, it's just, there's just a lot of like little tiny spots where it has to drill out and then go straight down and drill little areas out. And it's, you can imagine a circuit board with all the traces and everything flowing around. Yeah. Um, so that's probably design wise, that's the most complicated. Um, but as far as like, I guess the most rewarding design so far has been that uh, I needed a table to hold my laptop. So while I was cutting, so I built the, the, uh, the table um, from the original Maslow community garden. Um, awesome. That was really cool. Cause it's, it's all screwless. You don't have to put any screws or bolts or anything in it. You can, everything slots in. Um, but it's really dependent on the accuracy of the machine because if it's not accurate, it doesn't fit together properly. So, um, and it came out great. So that's awesome. Uh, How many I times did you have to cut it? What's that? How many times did you have to cut it before it came out? Great. Just once. Just once. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I mean, that's once on top of a couple of years of experience. So I kind of <laughs> maybe three hours of, of tinkering before I actually let the machine yeah. work. <laughs> just leave the other couple of years off and just say one time, well, one time. I just plugged it in and it just worked. <laughs> yeah. I know that's that's the thing. It's it's very process driven, and to me, that's one of the most rewarding things about um, dealing with this type of technology, where you you're going through that like step by step process of like bringing an idea to reality. Um, even if it's something that that you found, it's still going through that process and learning about it. And then and and getting that like satisfaction um, of you know of getting it done and being like ah it's tuned yes I did it <laughs> yeah ah. so yeah right I think um, I, I think uh, you know it's important for everyone to know that uh, by and large the CNC is a hobbyist CNC um, and it's for people who like to tinker and like to play mm -hmm. um, and it's in that it's it's in that niche so. Um, I think it's important that people realize that you have to put time into the machine. You have to learn the software. You have to learn all aspects of getting your design over, you know, because I mean, if you're, if your design is wrong, then your machine's not going to cut it. So right. um, it's along with the calibration and making sure everything is straight and, you know, making sure that everything is rigid. Um, you have to learn the software side of things. So once you get all that down, um, your brain starts to kind of function a little bit differently and makes it a lot easier to piece these projects together and kind of, kind of expect what issues you might encounter when you're, when you're building these projects. It's like a process. You're kind of getting your brain tuned to that like process based thinking of like, how can I make that thing right there? Like, what can I do to make this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. So Sarah, do we have any more questions? In Facebook or YouTube, maybe time for maybe like one or two more. No. So with uh, with working on the the Maslow and the M2 and all those different types of things, um, when you have you worked with other CNC machines? Do you have any uh, any experience with working with other CNC, or is the Maslow and the M2 are those the only two that that you've utilized? Um, yeah, I've worked with a couple of milling machines, uh, mostly metal milling. Um, 
So I, I design a lot of um, fittings and different kinds of items that I use in my day job, which is the film and television stuff. Um, and uh, I obviously can't talk about specific things, but I work primarily with Marvel and Disney. So um, you've probably seen some of the stuff I've done and probably didn't know it, but uh, I, I primarily do a lot of talk about stuff it. Stuff and things like that. <laughs> So a lot of that stuff is very custom. So um, I, I built a couple of things on some metal machines and uh, that we use um, for mounting cameras in weird places on helicopters and cars and um, crazy awesome. things. So, um, so have you cut out of other materials um, uh, with the M2 or the Maslow? Have you cut out of metal or anything like that? Um, or just plywood? Um, I haven't done any metal on the Maslow. Um, I'm not sure how it handles. Uh, I, I think I would be less concerned about the CNC and more concerned about the router and the bits. Um, so uh, I haven't really played with it too much, but it's definitely something that's on the list to, to try out. Have you done plastics um, on the Maslow? Um, yeah, HDPE. Really? And HDPE. Um, yeah, and I've done some foam. Uh, I did some foam inlays for some toolboxes uh, that worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, so I've used, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think it's called uh, Kaizen foam or Kaiser foam. Um, you can get it at like uh, a lot of the woodworking places and uh, big box stores. It's really thick, really thick foam. Um, and they have some, some stuff that's called shadow foam, uh, which has, uh, Two different layers one that's like a darker color and then one that's whatever color you want like red or blue so when mm -hmm. you cut into it the outline shows blue so you know what tool is missing and stuff like that so oh, okay. it, but yeah so I did, primarily use it for wood did you did you make that for like the arcade is that what you use the foam or what what did you cut with um foam for uh just for me just for tool inserts i have my shop has a ridiculous amount of tools and just I like to be organized. So, yeah. and I was losing my tools left and right just cause I'll tinker with something and then toss it to the side. So now yeah. when I open my toolboxes, I know exactly what tools are lying somewhere else that need to be replaced. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the fun thing too, is like making, seeing things around the house and be like, I can make something and solve this problem. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, well, I do 3d printing and stuff as well. So, um, oh yeah sweet yeah, yeah i play around with a lot of stuff and that honestly my goal is to use the machine to make my life in the shop easier um so the idea behind getting the cnc in the first place was so that i can focus on the electronics and focus on the the art and the design aspect while it's doing all of the cutting for me mm -hmm. so it kind of just frees me up to to do other things while it's doing the hard work <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. I, I mean, it, and that's why it's like one more tool in the toolbox that you can utilize. So with um, with CNC and 3D printing, have you ever done any projects with like both of those combined? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I just did. Um, I just made, um, I guess, what you would call a French cleat wall, uh, which is essentially um, a mounting option for um, putting all your tools on the wall. So okay. <clears throat> I build a lot of different tool holders off the Maslow that are for that French cleat system. But essentially it's just like, a wood cut like it's kind of, and then they can like interlock. Yeah, well, they, they, yeah, they're, they're cut it. They're, they're two pieces, I guess one piece of wood that you've stripped down the center um, at, at a 45 degree angle. And so when you put one on the wall, you reverse the other one. So it slots into the other. Oh, okay. And it takes yeah. all the weight off of it so that you can put it up. But, I build a lot of um, tool holders like for my drills and um, you know, I have a ridiculous amount of different size screws and you know, things like that. So I've kind of just built a bunch of, uh, a bunch of holders that'll sit up on the wall. Um, and that's mostly just for power tool stuff. Nice. So these two questions that kind of uh, go along with that are both about bits. So um, like, have you done projects with like multiple bits? And then if, if so, like, how do you go about changing them? So if you're, you know, doing a project that's, you know, maybe doing multiple cuts or different bits and like changing them in mid project or during the project, or how do you go about that? Um, so if I program one, that's my design, um, I put in a, a tool change pause, uh, which basically stops the machine. Uh, just turn off the router. It'll stay in position. Um, and I'm just very careful not to move the sled around too much. 
Um, yeah. And I just slide the whole thing out of the out of the holder, and then I can change the bit. Actually, the M2 makes that a lot easier because you can have access from the front, so it makes it a little easier. The last um, the last one that I was using, um, the rings kind of get in the way and uh, makes it a little bit difficult for the for. I'm not saying it isn't hard because changing bits uh, is definitely a difficult thing as far as accuracy is concerned. But when I do a design, I try to do a bit change after the cut is finished. So let's say I'm using like a V bit and then I'm using like a straight cut. Then um, I'll start with my straight cut or I'll start with my V bit. And then as soon as that operation is finished, um, it has a little bit of a lead in. So even if I slide my, you know, my sled around and I move it to a different position on accident, then it, it has to drag to the area where it's going to start that next operation in order to, you know, keep it, keep it accurate. And then that, that makes it helps it too. So then if you don't bump it a little bit, it's like changing filament. If you change filament in the middle of a 3d print, if you push the gantry down, if your gantry's not locked, then it's, you know, that nozzle's just going to collide and kind of the same thing. Like if you're changing it in the middle of the cut and, and it just wiggles just a little bit and then it's off, then yeah, that, I could see how that would just cascade out. And doing different like different cuts also shows like a well calibrated machine and how important that is. That it's always going to go back to home, and you know it's going to cut in the exact place that you want yeah. it. To. Honestly, I think the most important thing is just making sure that your G code is like just really good. Um, if you're not putting in those tool change pauses, then uh, I, it would be pretty difficult to make sure that that. I, I would think that you know once it moves on to the second command after you've changed your bit, you'll be back on track. But that first command, if you've moved the sled at all, or you've you know spun it or any kind of thing, it might cause a little bit of a hiccup. But um, when I do stuff like that, where it's a mid project bit change, um, I, I try to do that on projects where accuracy isn't super, super important. Um, just That's because of the nature of the machine, it is a very difficult machine to, to change bits in. Um, but it can be done. Yeah, it's possible. It's out there. You just have to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot for for speaking with us tonight. Um, and kind of go over some stuff. I know that you are our new mod in our group. So, do you have anything that you'd like to share as like a, any closing statements, any mod statements that you'd like to get out there? Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think so. I just want to. Uh, you know, I just. I just want to kind of grow with the community and. You know, I, I would love to, you know, I just want to let everybody know that, you know, for you, for those of you that are just joining, I do have a full-time job. So um, <laughs> I, I really would love to just sit at home and help everyone as much as I can, because that's what I like doing. But uh, unfortunately, I just can't get to everybody all the time. But if you sent me a message and I haven't responded yet, believe me, I've seen the message and I will respond to you. And um, I also don't want you guys to be afraid to ask me questions. Uh, I'm always happy to answer them. Um, but I'm also pretty technical, so if you send me a message and it's hidden in my requests, I get a lot of those, so I kind of visit that area pretty often. So don't be scared to send me a, a per personal message and you know reach out to me. I'm always happy to jump on Skype or jump on Zoom and kind of work through things. Um, unfortunately, my, my schedule is pretty full sometimes, so I don't always have time, but if you're willing to work with me as far as my schedule is concerned, you know my weekends are free. I like to jump on and help people or if you're even if you're local i'm in the atlanta area so if anyone in the atlanta area is here and you know needs help i'm always available and always happy to come over and help you with the calibrations or help you with your frame building anything you want well that's that's fantastic and, and i know that i speak for everybody here at maker made to say that we are super excited to have you a part of the community and to be working together and and it's been fun it's it's so great to see all the awesome projects that the community is like working together to make and to see different things so um yeah thank you so much for for being involved and making cool stuff and helping people make stuff as someone who also loves to to help people it's like got that that heart of a teacher in there i can see that you've got that too that you want to help be like i did this and so can you um and that's just fantastic so i also just wanted to add to that uh you know we had we had talked a little bit about uh possibly doing a live event where people can just ask questions yeah but what i would like to do is i would like to do a live event where um i do the design aspect of everything all the way to the cut um but yeah. i can do it on camera so people can ask questions as i'm going um and uh you know we'll focus on you know some really simple stuff so working with easel and yeah, uh, work 
that kind of software, and then some more advanced stuff for people who are sort of a little bit more farther along. So maybe focus on a little bit of um, Fusion 360 stuff, a little bit of Illustrator. Um, that way people can be like, wait, wait, I saw you do something, you hit a tool. But yeah, what was, that? <laughs> was, what was that? You know, and let's get that in the schedule. Straight, That's, you know, walk, walk you through the process completely from start to finish. Well, I know that you're a busy guy, so let's figure out, let's figure out a time to do that. That's, I think that would be fantastic to help beginners because design, that's the part that's tough for me too. Um, it's just, there's so much is when you, you open up something like fusion 360 and you're just like, <laughs> like yeah. what is all of this? You know, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. So let's, let's get that. Let's do that. That sounds awesome. I'd love to join that too. I want to, I want to, I want to hop in. <laughs> so yeah, cool. All right, Nick. Well, yeah, thanks a lot. Have a great night. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody to watching and um, look forward to talking to more of you. If you want to talk about your kind of projects or things like that, you can reach out to us at MakerMade. You can reach out to Nick too in the owners group and, uh, and, and we'll get it going. We'll, we'll build this community and we'll make some cool stuff. Awesome. All right. We'll see y'all later. See you, Nick. See you guys.